I'm uh, Frank von Hippel. I'm a professor of public and international affairs at Princeton University, and I'm a nuclear physicist by training. I work on nuclear materials issues uh, these days primarily. Uh, I call myself a policy physicist. Actually, I date back a long time because uh, on this because my grandfather was in the Manhattan Project, uh, and it, uh, but then uh, in professionally, when, as, as on my own, uh, I uh, the first issue I got involved with was so-called limited nuclear war, uh, and what happened was the then Secretary of Defense. This is in was in um, 1974, was testifying in, in front of uh, a Senate committee and uh, arguing for we needed a new missile uh, with 10 warheads. Uh, it, the Reagan administration finally field it was called the Peacekeeper and because the Soviet Union had a missile with 10 warheads and, and uh, we should have, with, you know, we, we were falling behind. And the, uh, and the, the idea of these, this missile was that it would, it would uh, target missiles on the other side. So in fact, one missile could kill up to 10 missiles on the other side with multiple warheads. And uh, this they, he called a limited nuclear war. You know, we're basically like a long range version of a World War I artillery duel. And, uh, a senator asked him, how many people would this kind of war, nuclear, limited nuclear war that you're talking about, kill? And he said, oh, 15, 20, 25,000 people. He said, it, it would be terrible, but nothing comparable to what we think about as nuclear war. And this senator said, well, that's, that's surprising to me that the numbers could be so low if you're talking about using thousands of nuclear weapons. And he asked for a peer review of the, of the uh, Department of Defense study. And I was inv invited to be part of that peer review. And, and uh, I went over and I, to talk to the people who had done the calculations and uh, learned the, how they had sort of their vocabulary was, was, uh, it, it was inverted. They would talk, when they talked about, um, a nuclear explosion targeted on a weapon, killing, destroying the town next, next to the weapon. They, they used the term collateral damage. And when they talked about two warheads targeted at the same target, then one exploding and destroying the other, they, they called that fratricide. And uh, it just, it just, uh, I started having nightmares about uh, this and anyway, the result of our of our peer review was that the that the Secretary of Defense's numbers was a, a thousand times too low. The numbers we found were twenty million, twenty five million, not twenty twenty five thousand. And so that was my first exposure to these issues. The, the progress toward a fissile material cutoff treaty has been stalled since the U, in 1993, the UN General Assembly uh, voted without a negative vote uh, to start negotiations. So it's almost 20 years ago now. Uh, and th there have not been negotiations because of uh, linkages that different, you know, different priorities and linkages I think um, it will come, uh, it, but it, it, um, the, the problem has, is that the negotiating forum, the uh, Conference on Disarmament has this requirement for consensus to proceed, and so one country can block it. And, and currently, if, it, it hasn't been Pakistan for the whole 10, 20 years, but, but it, currently it is Pakistan. You have a world in which U.S. And, and Russia have 
95, more than 95% of the nuclear ma weapons materials in uh, Britain, France, China, having about a percent each, and then North Korea maybe having 0.1% or something like that. In, in, in the case of the country, main countries that were involved in the Cold War, I mean, the, the uh, Russia, US, UK, France, they have no problem because they're downsizing their, their they've downsized already quite a bit their, their Cold War stockpiles. They, they have, uh, you know, there's no reason to produce more material. They have a lot of excess material coming out of weapons. Any new weapons that they want to make can be re used recycled material. China is, is, uh, is in a different situation. Uh, uh, China has always had a rather small stockpile, uh, and uh, and ch and there's um, the Chinese. All they want is a minimum deterrent. At least that's been. I think that's the dominant view in China, and uh, they the U.S. has been making them worry by its ballist ambitious ballistic missile defense program. And so the Chinese, uh, the one country of the P5, who have not announced that they've ended, they in fact have halted for tw more than 20 years production of nuclear materials. Uh, but they, they are keeping open the possibility of restarting if they find, if, if they become concerned that, that the US ballistic missile defense buildup becomes a challenge to their, um, their deterrent, the credibility of their deterrent. The, the other countries of, are Israel, where we don't know whether, whether they're uh, really producing more material for, for weapons or not. It's, it's, uh, uh, and uh, Pakistan and, Indi and, and India, where especially Pakistan is, is uh, is, is, is putting a lot of resources into building up its ability to produce. And that's, of course, creating an investment which they will want to then, in plutonium production now, that they will want to um, harvest the plutonium before they are willing to stop. So, so the Pakistanis by themselves, you know, if, if you wait for them to... Um, say, okay, we have enough, it might take five or 10 years. Uh, it might require pressure to, to, to accelerate them. It was a lot easier when we had a major a movement, a public movement. Uh, that's when we got a lot of the progress that we're talking about now. Uh, ending the Cold War, getting the CTBT negotiated, I, uh, and, and I think some people are trying to start a movement again. In, uh, you know, I found with politicians that the politicians, you know, if the public is interested in something, then the politicians learn about it. And, and as a result of the freeze movement, we had for 10, 15 years afterwards, a really well-educated Congress in the United States. And so, I know there's this effort, the Global Zero Movement is, is trying to, uh, to get a, you know, a, a uh, grassroots movement. There, I was just talking to a colleague over there about this humanitarian uh, argument against human, human rights argument, humanitarian argument against nuclear weapons. Uh, I, I do think we we have to uh, to support that you know the public interest as much as we in any way we can. With the end of the Cold War, the public assumed the issue has gone away, uh, and um, and in fact, you know, I I say sometimes that the public demobilized more rapidly than the the nuclear weapons establishments did, so that. Today it would take much less pressure uh, to to uh, to move these, this agenda along than it took during the Cold War, because in fact the militaries are not in, really interested in nuclear weapons. I mean, you have to guard them, you have to take care of them. You have, 
to train people, uh, but you, you don't use them. And, and so that's, and, and so the, I don't think that, the, I think the constituency for you know, maintaining nuclear weapons uh, is, is quite narrow now. And, but the, resi the resistance would be quite weak, but the pressure is even weaker. And so that there really is a sm very small, hardcore people who really sort of live and breathe nuclear weapons are sort of able to just continue on an inertial track, the, the Cold War inertial track. And so we have bizarre things like 20 years more than 20 years after the end of the Cold War, where where uh, uh, we have we have 2,000 nuclear missiles ready to launch within 15 minutes. The U.S. and Russia do at each other. We have to take this apart. I mean, that's the first step, I think. And, and uh, uh, I think we are moving. I mean, the CTPT is is uh, is very much a part of this because I've always. You know, there was, you know, the opposition to this, the, you know, I've, I was involved in the debate over the, uh, in the U.S. about a conference of testament, and I was involved also with, with uh, you know, in the debate in the Soviet Union with Ron Gorbachev. Uh, and the, the, the weaponeers always were opposing to the CTBT, not on technical reasons. Technically, you can maintain nuclear weapons forever without testing. But they, they somehow they thought it would be the end of, you know, it, the nuclear weapons would just sort of fade into irrelevance. And I think the, the, uh, op the uh, proponents of, this, of the, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty also somehow felt that if, if you don't test them, they will disappear. I think the, the you know the U.S. Uh, National Academy of Sciences just came out with a new report, and I, th I think you know they it I think it's basically the strongest part is is um, is the argument they say look we have a choice between two worlds, a world in which people countries are free to test, or a world in which countries could maybe test at very very small nuclear explosions and and not be detected with a 100% probability. Uh, which world would you prefer to live in? <laughs> I think that's the choice. I mean, they, they, and, and, and I think it's very well put. There's no way that you can argue that a zero yield test ban is absolutely verifiable. But, the, but it, so it's, it's a question of whether it's verifiable enough so it's better than no treaty. And, and there, there the arguments are a thousand to one. Yeah. Uh, this is a, a wonderful modern system that, that has been put together worldwide and you know, with the, with the uh, headquarters here in Vienna. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very impressive, and and we of course are, are finding now that we've now that the CTBTO has instrumented the world that that this, these this network is useful for other things such as tsunami and, and uh, warning and, and looking at the at the uh, if if a reactor accident happens to to uh, understand what the spread of the radioactivity through the atmosphere so. It's it's a it's a very low cost operation, about a hundred million, and 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 compared to, you know, the if you add up the nuclear budgets of the weapon states, it must be, uh, you know, more than a hundred billion. It must be uh, a year. Uh, uh, it's going to maintaining, operating. Rebuilding, recycling nuclear weapons and their delivery systems, and so it's it's a really a good investment. If we you know, we will be paid back many times over uh, for the uh, CTBTO and its system. Uh, if we if if it if it has an effect of strengthening the taboo against nuclear weapons and people deciding. Nuclear weapons are a waste of money and, and, and uh, we should 
we should use the money for more productive uh, purposes. So I, uh, there's no question that, uh, uh, and, and you know, just you know, not not counting the side benefits that, that, such as um, that I mentioned, like the tsunami uh, if, if, uh, warnings and having a global system uh, to to monitor radioactive releases and so on. Well, I ask, you know, I used to ask my students, uh, you know, what do you think the probability is of a nuclear war? And uh, is it 1% a year, 10th of a percent a year? And uh, it typically would seem something like that. And, uh, well, that's too high. I mean, that, that, that means we're in a situation in where, where it probably won't happen next year. Uh, but cumulatively, the probability of it happening in this century or, uh, or it becomes unacceptable. I mean, when you think of, of uh, that it would be probably by a mistake, uh, you know, a, uh, or a madman. I mean, one of the problems with nuclear weapons is, is the amount of arbitrary power that's concentrated into the hands of a few people. I remember that, that you know, and at the end of the Watergate uh, you know, crisis in the, in the United States, President Nixon began to drink a lot. And I remember his Secretary of State, I'm Secretary of Defense, going to the Pentagon and, and telling the people at the command post there, he said, if President Nixon calls up and tells you to launch the nuclear weapons, check with me first. I mean, that's a crazy situation that if, you know, where, where uh, a small number of people can, can uh, within a matter of minutes, decide to kill or hundreds of millions of people, you know, maybe a billion people if we have, you know, or, or more if we, if we t take into account these indirect climate, you know, effects on the climate, the agriculture. That might result. So, so uh, I mean, this is the first global threat: the nuclear nuclear war, the the, the, the doomsday machine we built up uh, as a result of the Cold War, and, and then just left there when 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 the Cold War ends. We have now have another global threat, which is climate change, uh, and uh, we should get rid of. We should get rid of the, the nuclear one is much easier to get rid of. And first of all, we should get that out of the way so we can, we can focus on, on the climate change and, and perhaps other global threats like pandemics and so on that we'll, we'll have to worry about in the future. We, we just can't leave this, this uh, legacy of, of the insane Cold War sitting here, uh, you know, we can't just walk walk away f from a from a time bomb which is which is still ticking. You've got to you've, you've got to defuse it.